Lovely. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Barry Cole from the Director of Research here at the Institute. It's a real pleasure to welcome those of you who have made uh, the trip to join us here in our headquarters in Norcott, Georgia Street, and hello to those online. Really pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Alexander Chance, who uh, feels like a new friend here at the Institute. We're delighted to have you here, Alex, and really looking forward to your presentation on illicit finance implications for national security and the need for a new strategic response. The event is going to be chaired by the great Mary Whelan, uh, retired of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Without further ado, Mary, very happy to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I like that. Uh, you're all very welcome here uh, this afternoon. Um, those of you who are present who have joined us online. Uh, we have a very interesting topic today, illicit finance implications for national security and the need for a new strategic response. Before formally introducing our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Alexander Chance. Uh, just a few. The presentation will last 20, 25 minutes. The floor is open uh, to those who are here in the room. Uh, those online can uh, send in their questions or comments using the Q&A. And the Q&A are on the record. I should do so using the handle at EA. Um, I've got rid of the, the housekeeping part. So it's a great pleasure now that I uh, formally Dr. Alexander Chance. Uh, Alex, head of policy and research at Transparency International, which is the Irish chapter of Transparency International, which you probably know better as TI, a global organization working against. 100 countries. At Transparency Ireland, Alex runs its programme on political integrity, anti-corruption and anti-money laundering, which was, are funded by the EU Internal Security Fund and the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. In addition to his role at Transparency International, Alex is a senior fellow at the Azure Forum for Contemporary Security Strategy and an associate fellow at RUSI within the Organised Crime and uh, Policing Group. He previously served in the UK National Crime Agency in operational strategy and management positions, focused on tackling transnational organised crime. And in that capacity, he spent five years in South America. And you have also, I understand, consulted with various UN and other uh, international bodies. Alex obtained his examined the relationship between organised crime, high-level corruption in post-war Mozambique. He also holds an MPhil in International Peace Studies from Trinity College and a BA in Law and Politics from Durham University, an Irish and a UK national. Without further ado, I'll give you the floor, Alex. We very much look forward to what you have to tell us today. No, no, no. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, thank you to Kian and thank you to Barry for your uh, very, very warm welcome uh, to the Institute. It's a real pleasure and a privilege uh, to be here and to be addressing such an illustrious and diverse audience, both here in the room uh, and online. Funnily enough, when I first came to study in Ireland nearly 25 years ago, showing my age here, uh, I spent a year living just around the corner in Gardner Place. And although some of my fellow students at Trinity were rather curiously, to my mind, alarmed at this floppy haired uh, Englishman. Yeah, there was hair living here at one point. Uh, I actually had the most wonderful time uh, living in this community and, and have huge affection for it. So it's great to be back. One of my enduring memories from that period, nearly a quarter of a century ago, was right going for long training runs along the Liffey um, through what was then a largely undeveloped largely deserted and, and in some cases derelict Docklands area. Today, of course, those same areas are completely transformed, almost unrecognizable with these vast glass and steel uh, fronted offices, not only of the expanded IFSC, but also various multinationals from the world of tech, finance, uh, banking, law, accounting, consulting, and so on. Together, of course, with the central bank, the convention center, and the three arena on the site of the old point depot. Now, whatever you think about the merits or lack thereof of the architecture, uh, it seems fair to say that the opening up of Ireland's uh, economy has brought immense benefits, not only to Dublin, 
uh, but also to the prosperity of the country as a whole. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you and to spell out the innumerable ways in which Ireland's role as an international financial centre has played an important part in bringing investment, jobs and economic growth to the country over the past couple of decades. But the world is changing and it's changing fast. And those of you at the IIEA don't need me to tell you that. Global shocks such as COVID and the invasion of Ukraine have forced policymakers to reevaluate long held assumptions and orthodoxies in a whole range of fields, from the wisdom of just in time supply chains, for example, to the reliance on certain energy sources. And the more open a system is, the more pressing are those evaluations. Today, I want to suggest that here in Ireland, we're well overdue a fundamental re-evaluation of our response to illicit financial flows, and that failing to do so poses serious risks to our national security. Uh, but first, some definitions. What do I mean by illicit financial flows? I'm going to use the definition that we've adopted in Transparency International, which is similar to the UN definition, whereby illicit financial flows refer to money or assets that are illegally acquired, transferred, or spent across borders. And when I refer to national security, I'm going to use a broad definition, which understands national security to mean the protection and safety of the political, economic, and other interests and values of the state. In terms of structure, let's see if I can get this, get this working. Um, I'm going to split my remarks into two sections. The first half is going to look at illicit finance in its global context. Uh, we'll examine the main threats from illicit finance, common deficiencies that exacerbate those threats and emerging responses to them. The second half will look specifically at illicit finance in the Irish context, including both our own, oh, there we go, including both our own uh, vulnerabilities and our strengths. And I don't want to, I, I want to show that there are some qualified grounds uh, for optimism in this respect. But ultimately, I want to show you that in a very rapidly changing world, a globally connected country needs to get onto the front foot on this issue and fast. And for that to happen, I will argue, we need a whole new strategic response to the threat posed by illicit finance. By way of conclusion, I'm going to sketch out a vision for what that response might look like in practice, which I hope might provoke some interesting conversation in our Q&A afterwards. So illicit finance in the global context. In looking at the threat landscape around illicit finance, it's perhaps worth bearing a couple of points in mind. The first is that almost any security threat one cares to think about has a financial element, even if the threat itself is ideologically motivated. So most terrorist attacks, for example, will require financing to a greater or lesser degree. And of course, on the other hand, almost any investigation into a security threat is likely to have a significant financial component. The second point is that traditionally, illicit finance was thought of as referring only to different forms of organized crime and terrorism. And indeed, the whole machinery of anti-money laundering has been built around those threats, a point I'll come back to in a few minutes. Now, those threats are very real. And in fact, one could argue that certainly in some parts of the world, criminal wealth has grown to such an extent that organized crime groups can threaten the stability and the integrity of entire states, societies, or huge global financial institutions. It wasn't so long ago, for example, that the banking giant HSBC was found by the US authorities to have laundered at least, at least $800 million worth of drug money on behalf of the Sinaloa cartel in Mexico and the Norte del Valle cartel in Colombia. So we can't, certainly can't afford to lose sight of the threat posed by criminal and terrorist finances. But in more recent years, there's been increasing acknowledgement that the threat from illicit finance is considerably wider and more insidious than solely the laundering of proceeds of drug sales, human trafficking, arms dealing, and so on. Because dirty money is also being used to intentionally undermine our political systems through what are sometimes referred to as active financial measures or strategic corruption. Now, these measures assume different forms in different contexts, but they all deploy corrupt or illicit finance as a tool to increase influence 
or to shape the political environment in a targeted country or institution, and thereby to achieve certain strategic objectives. One form might use money to build long-term relationships, for example, through donations to research institutions, cultural or sporting organizations, which in turn provides donors with access to policymakers or other prominent individuals. Soccer fan fans amongst you might recall that until 2022, the UEFA Champions League was sponsored by Gazprom. Or it might take the form of more direct financing to those with influence, such as bribes paid to MPs or political parties to advance the interests of another country, as is alleged to have taken place in the Qatargate scandal in the European Parliament. In its most serious form, the weaponization of finance constitutes one part of hybrid warfare, alongside cyber attacks, disinformation, the use of proxies, and other forms of economic manipulation. Left unchecked, the threats from both criminal and politically motivated illicit finance can have very real and very serious implications. Economically, they can undermine entire financial systems and organizations, as we saw with the Danske Bank scandal, for example. Dirty money can also distort entire sections of the or sectors of the economy. It's been argued, for instance, that Toronto's entire property market has been significantly elevated by the volume of criminal profits being laundered through Ontario's real estate sector. Politically, the cumul cumul cumulative effect of such scandals helped to foster growing cynicism towards democracy and the institutions that, under that underpin democracy. So having sketched out the threats from illicit finance globally, I want to briefly mention some common deficiencies or vulnerabilities that in many countries exacerbate those threats. As I mentioned earlier, the entire edifice of global anti-money laundering, or AML as it's known, has been built around the prevention and detection of criminal finances. And to be blunt, it doesn't perform this role very well. The Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, is the body responsible for setting global anti-money laundering standards. And it's come under increasing criticism for its emphasis on procedure over outcomes and for presiding over a system that causes let's be honest, huge inconvenience and cost to legitimate businesses and customers without seeming to have a massive impact on criminals moving their money. It's also been slow to respond to calls to broaden its scope to include less obvious forms of illicit finance, such as strategic corruption. But many of the deficiencies in tackling illicit finance are to be found at nation state level. Countries have become adept at implementing FATF or other AML standards whilst in practice taking very little effective enforcement action. In a lot of places, policy efforts to prevent or detect dirty money are very much subservient to the interests of free-flowing global capital, representing a form of what we in TI call regulatory capture. In many contexts, there's also a severe disparity between the burden of compliance and liability carried by regulated sectors, such as traditional banks and non-regulated sectors. Law enforcement agencies and regulators are often woefully under-resourced, including the financial intelligence units that analyze suspicious transactions. The keeping of and access to company ownership and property registers remains patchy, despite these being absolutely key tools for financial investigations. And globally, rates of asset recovery remain stubbornly low. One, one reason being that the eye-watering cost of pursuing such cases against well-funded legal teams acts as a powerful disincentive, leaving authorities to instead focus on the low-hanging fruit. And where states have taken action, it's often against the most visible and ostentatious markers of illicit, illicit wealth, the bling, one might call it, of yachts, sports cars, and so on, rather than the invested wealth, which is much harder to pin down. But despite all these challenges, recent years and the last two years in particular have seen a flurry of activity against illicit finance. At the political level, throughout the Western world, there's been increasing recognition that illicit finance represents a serious threat to national security for all the reasons I outlined a few moments ago. The European Commission president in her State of the Union address about 18 months ago highlighted the threat from corrupt finance, including as a vector for foreign influence operations. The White House has named corruption as a core national security issue facing the US, with a corruption portfolio added to the US National Security Council and curbing illicit finance set as a strategic priority.
The UK's review of security, defence, development and foreign policy identified illicit finance as a key transnational challenge for that country. So this acknowledgement of illicit finance as a national security threat has had several important practical effects. One has been an increased willingness to devote legislative time and political attention to closing loopholes. At the EU level, we can see this in the robust anti-money laundering package that was recently agreed between the European Parliament and Council. In the US, we're seeing ever more robust uh, approach towards illicit finance. For example, the Treasury's recently adopted, uh, recently proposed rule to combat money laundering in the investment advisory sector. Similarly, in the UK, last year's Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act was an important and very much overdue attempt to close loopholes around illicit finance. And we've also seen growing recognition of the impact that dirty money can have on overseas development, on conflicts, on peace building, and the incorporation of asset recovery into tax reform and overseas aid policies. For their part, lower and middle income countries are quite understandably increasingly less willing to be lectured by Western countries on corruption and governance when illicit finance flows and flows to and is invested and spent in those very same countries. So we've looked at illicit finance in the global context, the threat it poses, common deficiencies, and the way in which states are stepping up their responses. But what about illicit finance in the Irish context? Is this simply a case of much ado about nothing, or perhaps just another front in the shifting sands of great power rivalry in which Ireland has little interest in getting sucked in? Well, aside from the fact that there are both criminal as well as political elements to illicit finance, and the lines between the two are increasingly blurred, Having set ourselves up as an international financial centre, I would argue that we simply don't have the luxury of pretending that this challenge doesn't concern us. Or to coin a phrase, you might not be interested in illicit in, in dirty money, but dirty money is definitely interested in you or your financial system. Let's just consider for a moment the numbers involved. It's actually, it's hard to overstate the pace and the scale of increase in the volume of assets flowing through Ireland over the past 15 or so years in particular via the investment funds industry. So between 2006 and 2021, net assets held in Irish domiciled funds leapt from 650 billion euros to over 4 trillion euros. Over the same period, assets under administration here grew from 965 billion euros to over 5 trillion euros. Between 2017 and 2020 alone, cross-border payments tripled. In 2020, Ireland became the largest hedge fund administration centre in the world, servicing 40% of all hedge fund assets globally. By 2022, Ireland was the domicile for nearly 6% of global investment fund assets and 19% of European fund assets, making it the third largest fund centre in the world and the second largest and fastest growing centre in Europe. And while I don't for a moment want to tar the whole funds industry, I do suggest that it's inconceivable that a proportion of those funds are not from illicit uh, sources, and that the failure to tackle them poses serious risks to our economic, diplomatic, and political interests. In other words, to our national security. Economic in terms of the risk to the credibility and integrity of our financial system and institutions, a risk that will only grow as other economies target harden. Political in terms of feeding cynicism towards democracy, if citizens feel that the system is loaded in favour of global capital and against the average Joe. And diplomatic, both in terms of Ireland being left behind as other states take this more seriously, as well as our soft power, including our overseas development agenda, being undermined if we're seen as a soft touch for dirty money. But don't just take my word for it. In 2020, the FBI warned how private equity and hedge funds were being used in support of fraud, organized crime, sanctions evasion, and highlighted funds with accounts in Ireland, Ireland and the Cayman Islands. In 2022, the IMF warned that Ireland is facing a substantial money laundering threat from foreign proceeds of crime due to the prominence of its financial sector, and that the rapid growth in the size of the Irish financial sector had further increased the risk from non-resident and cross-border activity, with investment funds particularly vulnerable to money laundering. Now, I don't want to paint, as I said earlier, an overly pessimistic picture here, 
In some respects, Ireland is actually quite well placed to rise to this challenge. One of the key strengths here is a strong heritage of innovation and tenacity in terms of going after domestic criminal finances. Both the creation of the Criminal Assets Bureau and the civil forfeiture regime that was created around it in 1996 were in many ways groundbreaking and for years have been looked to by other countries as something of a gold standard in terms of clawing back the proceeds of crime. In the intervening years, the guards, the DPP and the judiciary have all become quite familiar with the use of civil powers against criminal assets. And it seems that these powers enjoy quite widespread popular support. At a more strategic level, we have various structures and initiatives that should be capable of taking on illicit finance from overseas. There's the Advisory Council on Economic Crime and Corruption created in 2022 to bring together various experts in financial crime from across government. There's the National Security Analysis Centre, from which we should, should soon see the long-awaited national security strategy, which is likely to include consideration of hybrid threats. And there's an ongoing public conversation, at times heated, around national security and defence, which again has prompted discussion of hybrid forms of aggression. In Ireland's private sector, we have huge expertise in fields relevant to tackling illicit finance, including AML, other forms of financial compliance, cybersecurity, law, accounting, fintech, and so on. So we're certainly not bereft of people with relevant skills. But at the same time, we do have certain systemic weaknesses and vulnerabilities. The first is successive governments' willingness to allow specific loopholes to persist until they're forced into taking some remedial action. We've seen, for example, that only now is the government introducing legislation to tighten the law around limited partnerships, seven years after similar structures in Scotland were shown to be vulnerable to criminal use, and three years after journalists warned that two thirds of general partners in Irish limited partnerships were based in offshore secrecy jurisdictions, such as Belize, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Panama and the Seychelles. Similarly, since 2017, academics at Trinity Business School have been warning that Irish special purpose vehicles have been used for shadow banking and round tripping, in other words, recirculating capital out of and back to Russia, made possible by minimal regulation and opaque ownership structures. To date, though, here in 2024, there's been little movement to remedy these loopholes. Second, there's a very pronounced dislocation between the steady and I have to say impressive stream of prosecutions and asset forfeiture cases against domestic criminal finance and the relative lack of cases targeting the proceeds of overseas crime and corruption that have been laundered through Ireland. I'd love to be proven wrong and I stand to be proven wrong on this but to my knowledge of the handful of overseas corruption cases that have come before the Irish courts all of them were instigated by foreign, typically US law enforcement, rather than by Irish authorities. And this isn't a dig at the guards. When set against the scale of assets flowing through Ireland, the resourcing of key bodies, including the Financial Intelligence Unit and the International Corruption Unit is tiny, and I would argue wholly inadequate. But this speaks to a far more deep-seated and important weakness in the existing framework, which essentially comes down to a lack of genuine political interest in tackling illicit finance from overseas. We saw this at play last year, when in one breath, the government launched its bid to host the EU's new AML authority, and in another, it adopted the most restrictive possible interpretation of an EU Court of Justice ruling, which essentially prevented journalists and civil society from accessing company ownership information. If I was being provocative, I might characterize this to use a Brexit phrase as having your cake and eating it approach. We'll take all the benefits of free flowing international capital and we'll ignore the risks. So whilst the, the, the rest of the Western world is hurriedly and in many cases belatedly putting in place the resources, the legislation and the policies to prevent and detect illicit financial flows. Here, we're sticking dogmatically to the mantra of light touch regulation. And there was a great illustration of this a couple of years ago, when after a newspaper investigation showed how the company registration system was being abused to create hundreds of fake companies, the government insisted that it had no role to play in verifying details of new companies and directors since it was long-standing government policy to maintain a good faith approach to corporate registrations. Now, even if such an approach was appropriate to more innocent times, and I would argue it never was, 
it's certainly not appropriate for the global environment that we're now entering. So in conclusion, and I will conclude <laughs> shortly, I want to suggest that here in Ireland, we have a choice. Either we maintain the status quo, in which the focus remains overwhelmingly on the short to medium term benefits of a highly open and highly exposed financial system and a light touch regulatory approach, and we leave the fallout for future governments and future populations to deal with. We might tinker around the edges, improve a few laws here and there, perhaps when embarrassed into action by some revelations in the media or forced to do so by the EU or in anticipation of FATF coming to town. But essentially, we, we remain largely passive in terms of dealing with illicit finance. An approach which I have to say, having worked uh, in UK law enforcement, is not unlike that adopted by the UK governments for, for, for many, many years until it was finally shaken out of its slumber by the Ukraine war. Or we can build on Ireland's legacy of dealing robustly with criminal finance, domestic criminal finances and get ahead of this threat before it's too late, and possibly even take a leadership role in showing how to tackle illicit finance with, whilst remaining an attractive center for legitimate international business. As I said, we have the people, we have the expertise, we have the international connectivity. But to make this shift would require political will and a genuinely whole of government and whole of society response. So what would such an approach look like in practice? A few headline thoughts that I'll close with. First, we need to, to urgently review and close outstanding loopholes that enable or allow illicit finance, including, for example, special purpose vehicles, trusts and shelf companies. Second, we need a complete overhaul of the corporate registration regime. The company's registration office should have a statutory mandate to ensure the integrity and the transparency of its registers, and it needs the powers and the resources to fulfill that mandate. Third, we need an impartial strategic assessment of the threat to Ireland from illicit finance in its broadest sense, so that we know exactly what we're up against. Fourth, fourth, we need the national security strategy to include illicit finance alongside other hybrid threats and to set the strategic framework for an integrated response. Fifth, we need substantial investment in enforcement bodies so that they're adequately resourced and incentivized to detect and pursue illicit financial flows from overseas. Crucially, this must include ring fence funding for lengthy, complex, multi-jurisdictional and very costly court cases. Sixth, we need to identify how we're going to sustainably fund this more robust approach. Across the Irish Sea, the UK have introduced a specific economic crime levy and they're next month increasing the fees to register new companies. We might need to think along similar lines. And seventh and finally, we needed a genuinely whole of government and whole of society response to illicit finance a response that sits above the interests of any one individual government department, which is open to private sector and civil society input, and which holds all, these, all, all of those involved accountable for playing their part in the response to this threat. So I'm gonna wrap up there. Thank you for listening. Uh, and I hope that some of what I've said leads to an interesting and productive discussion. Thank you.